Thank you for the invocation and the pledge, ladies. Uh, now we're going to have a staff update from Christina. Thank you so much. Uh, staff update is pretty simple. Um, we are a full staff now. We did lose Yvonne last month. Uh, we'll all miss her, but I know that she's going on to her next journey and, and she's doing well. Uh, didn't want to let you guys know that we do have our golf tournament that is coming up and they are looking for volunteers. So if any of you are interested, uh, please let us know and we'll put you in the right direction. So some of you have gotten emails from me uh, regarding different activities that are going on in your districts. If you haven't gotten one of those yet, you will. As crew sends them to me, I send them to you. It is part of the bylaws that you try to attend something in your area during the year. So if you need any more information or any more direction, please reach out to us and we're happy to help you. So if you do attend those, we're happy to meet you there as well, walk you through what crew does and introduce you to any public officials that you don't know. So thank you all. I'm gonna turn it back over to the chair. Uh, do we have the date for the golf tournament, ladies? We will get that to you. All right, I'm hoping that everyone got a chance to review the minutes that were sent to us from our January meeting. And if uh, I'm asking if there's any corrections or modifications that need to be made. Okay, we need to correct Richard's name. His name was misspelled. <laughs> Anything else? Anybody else notice any modifications that need to be made? Okay. Okay, we'll definitely get that corrected. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the me meeting minutes from the January 10th meeting? Okay, Bill Day has made the movement and Steve Bonnet has seconded. Okay, uh, then the meeting minutes of January 10th, 2024 stand is approved. Do we want to go into the data center growth brief? Yes, yes, yes. So we have a presentation today that will be given by Ben Jordan. Uh, he's here to speak to you on data centers. This was requested after an article appeared in the newspaper in December. And uh, I'm gonna turn it over now to Mr. Jordan. Thank you. Okay, uh, good morning, almost afternoon, everyone. I'm Ben Jordan, Director of Business and Economic Development. I've uh, been at CBS Energy for 20 years, and so recently moved into this role, but uh, familiar. I'm an electrical engineer, licensed in the state of Texas, and uh, happy to be here, and thank you guys for, for having me. So uh, when I have this open, I'll go through the presentation and uh, just have a conversation. You guys have questions along the way, please feel free to stop me at any time, and we'll get them addressed. So I'm going to talk to you guys about just some industry information, uh, put some statistics out there. We'll talk about uh the maps about where they are where the interest areas are in our in our service territory and then we can get into how we're doing that as an organization so i know uh we talked about there was a express news articles we've we also talked about this at the risk management committee uh earlier in december and this is a big topic we're getting a lot of interest from data centers uh, data center customers, as we work with them and collaborate with them, they're letting us know like how their business is evolving and how it's changing. Historically, like in around 20, maybe about 10 years ago, we had our first big data center come into town, which was Microsoft, and it was like 30 megawatts, right? Now we're getting larger uh, megawatt requests from data center customers in the hundreds of megawatts. And so we just want to make sure you guys, you guys know we're paying attention to this being very mindful of it. And it is, uh, you know, with our generation plan and our transmission system, we're paying attention to this. What's different about uh, the data center customers now? So before you kind of heard everybody migrating just normal back office business infrastructure into the cloud, well, that, that's going into the just typical kind of standard server base that has a, a load growth of say 100 megawatts, right? So. Now, with the influx of artificial intelligence and AI that you hear in the media and the news, that is in communication with our, with our customers and our partners that we have here and people that are looking to come to San Antonio, they're telling us that the amount of energy that it requires for the computing power for AI is a lot different than just kind of storing back office uh, infrastructure. So you have two waves of businesses migrating all their back office infrastructure to the cloud, like what we're doing as well. And then we also have AI, which is on top of that. So you're getting like five or seven fold of the energy demand for that sort of computing power that they're, they're preparing for that in advance. So they're scouring the world, quite frankly, for electrons. 
and they want it fast, right? They're, they're trying to get access to this energy super fast and, and they want a low cost. So they're interested in our, as much as they might say that our, uh, the cost is, is higher, it, we still have a really decent rate you know, compared to the world. And so we are a big area of interest for these kinds of customers. They're also asking us for, for zero carbon goals as well. Just like there's a lot of businesses that have you know, zero, zero carbon goals and they've, they've changed them a little bit um, over the years. So we had um, our strategic planning uh, activities earlier in the year as we put our business plans together and we prepare for this. This was front and center with our leadership team uh, from Rudy on down. Uh, we've actually reorganized a little bit and we can talk about that later to, to focus on these kinds of customers. Uh, we're good at ingesting customers, um, like large commercial, like your HEBs, your Walmarts, your, your kind of what we'll call large commercial con customers. These customers require a different level of service. Uh, they're asking, we have to do transmission level analysis because it impacts the, the ERCOT Texas grid, the transmission system, because of the amount of energy that they're, they're requiring us to do. So it's a different level of analysis required to give them the response to make decisions on how they want to, if they want to purchase the land or not. And then it is, uh, you know, we're paying attention to them and we're make, integrating them into the process. So here's some of the statistics I talked about that I wanted to mention, you know, it is, it is significant. So right now, just to level set, we've got about 324 megawatts of data center load right now. And that's, that's spread over about five or six locations. Um, right now we're working, we have agreements in place because this is significant infrastructure. So the infrastructure we're building for these kinds of customers is, is substation base so you, you you guys are familiar with our substation infrastructure that's behind the fence it serves the community uh, you know you know it's serving 20 to 30 thousand people we're building one of these large infrastructure power substations for for this kind of a customer that's requesting this amount of energy yes sir just a quick question i i know we've talked before about the fact that, that the transmission lines are uh, it's kind of a question, do you actually finance this in place for the long distance transmission lines? For the transmission lines you're talking about just within our network, how is that handled? Uh, you mentioned ERCOT, but how is all that handled? So there's a, there's a process. So as we get large infrastructure and there's the load that justifies the ask, we coordinate with ERCOT and the Public Utility Commission. So the funding is, uh, is through our our transmission cost of service recovery that's how that's that's how we recover that cost so we actually invest the build line and then get reimbursed correct yes sir the these data center customers also do you have something to add channel sorry for forgot there's one line just to more fully explain that um the way it works in Texas across the whole system is any utility that's putting in transmission services makes the investment to put in the transmission service and then those transmission costs of service are then submitted to the PUC for reimbursement to the utility. But in Texas, those transmission costs are then spread out and assigned and collected from all of the customers in Texas in a postage stamp rate is what they call it because it's split up among the customers evenly because we all benefit from having a full and good transmission system. Um, we're actually going to be going before the PUC for a full transmission rate case, um, which is a, a true up of the charges that we have been um, submitting and then recovering um, through the PUC uh, and we expect to file uh, next year. Um, so we'll we are planning on bringing a bunch of educational information to this group about how that will work for us specifically and with the Texas system in general. Great question. So uh, back to your uh, the overall marketplace, right? I get the demand where it's coming from AI and data centers generally, right? The growth of the internet. Why San Antonio? So we asked our customers that, that question. So where San Antonio is physically located, historically, we haven't had much, we're, we're far enough inlet for natural weather events that come from the coast. Uh, we have strong communication infrastructure in some instances with uh, that have been established and the low cost of energy, quite frankly. 
Okay, that that's key. Low cost of energy, right? Mm -hmm. That's established and uh, considered in the data center industry. That's why people are coming here. Because I, I guess we're like a what a secondary or tertiary market for data centers, right? Something like that. So, like I mentioned earlier, they're they're scouring the earth, and, and so like da Dallas, right, is a, is one of the big hubs that you hear about, where you hear a lot of data center interest. But yeah, they're they're really just looking for how fast they can get it, and from anywhere, quite frankly, at this point. So they're not they're not discriminating against where, but historically, I think in Virginia, there's a lot of interest in Virginia. That's like the data center mecca. But also locally, you got Dallas and Houston. I think Dallas is kind of a bigger hub for data centers right now at the moment as well. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So um, not not too much of an eye chart, but kind of some some swim lanes. But you kind of remember like a megawatt is around 200 homes. And we're talking in the hundreds of megawatts here. So, uh, like I mentioned, we have 324 active. Like that's the data centers that we have right now. That's the load in general. We have we're working on seven different data centers right now, to the tune of 457 megawatts in the next five years. It's what's been requested. We work with the data centers on really how we ramp them up and how we bridge their power so we can build large infrastructure. So typically we're we're, we're giving them temporary power, or bridging power for two or three years while they while they ramp up to their ultimate load request. But you can see that the amount of energy that's been requested is to the tune in ten years is you know three point three gigawatts. Our entire service territory, just to put it in perspective, is is around the seven, you know, just seven, just south the seven gigawatt range. So it's pretty significant. Yes, sir. I guess I've got some questions, but uh, it's it's kind of overwhelming to go from 324 and adding 3,400 in the next 10 years. How does how does CPS plan for that? Mm -hmm. And and this is assuming that all of these agreements are going to be approved and go into place. What is that process, and does it go through the city? Good question. So this is what's been requested, and not necessarily what. Will be conserved yet. We've got to go through a significant amount of diligence, coordination, and effort on the engineering side to answer the first questions. So the ones that are closer to becoming real projects are in the executed agreement phase. They've already bought property, and we're in the we're in the process of of building a plan to help build the infrastructure. So to your point is I, like I mentioned before, you know we've we've incorporated this into our strategic plan. And it, it impacts the generation portfolio and is putting stress on our generation plan, quite frankly. And so we're paying attention to that. Yes, sir. Real quick, is there is there an incentive for any of these companies with these big demand to uh, basically build their own generation? There's not an incentive for it. No, sir. Um, I mean, to, to build their own generation? Yeah, so instead of putting all the demand on CPS, can they build their own power generation system? So they're are are, are they are they ever in, incentivized to do something like that? No, there's not an incentive to do that. I think that in some portions of because of the amount of energy that they're asking, that's really quite frankly one of the discussions that's going on in that industry is they build their own generation. I think we are because we're a municipality, we're a fully integrated utility. You know, there's some things we'd have to talk about to enable that. Uh, but right now, there's nothing to incentivize it. These data center customers are also very risk averse, so they have a lot of redundant pieces of equipment. They're always duplicating everything that we build, and that that they bear the full cost of that. But but they're like they're extra redundant pieces of equipment that are being put in place day one, for example, and all the other infrastructure for cabling is all paid for up front prior to to building it. But they also have their own backup generation, which goes back to their zero carbon goals. So we are having discussions with them about natural gas solutions, but that's a, they have to be in close proximity to high pressure gas lines and things of that nature to really, to make that a viable solution for them. So right now, historically, they, they're on uh, diesel generation. Now I'll, I'll tell you that this last winter, uh, just stood up a winter demand response program, you know, data centers did participate in that. And so they were able to go on backup generation, you know, for a period of time when you had a high peak 
high peak demand, for example. So there's there, there's a lot of good things that we're working with on that, but it's very preliminary. Yes, sir. Um, for this process, um, I know we have the Sparks uh, uh, planning cycle. During the planning cycle, is there a way that we can figure out if we have a market cap or there's a very specific clientele that we would like to, you know, that we can ever take care of? And, and for all, for, for sake of argument, most markets have a entry and an exit, and most markets only cater to certain clients or a certain size of client. Um, I know in California, they've, they're known as Silicon Valley, and we're soon we're going to be known as Silicon Hills. Um, we don't want to be to a point to where they buy everything, and then we, we, we have an over, over supply of, of meeting data center's needs while sacrificing customer needs. Um, do we have a process or a point to where we, we have to either bar the door saying we can't accept any more clients? Has there a process been made yet or have we gone to there yet? Right. So we're not discriminating against the ask right now. We're, we're, we're doing what we can to see what we can provide an answer. And I'm going to be honest, sometimes we can't build it fast enough for them. So they, they move on. So there is some natural, I guess they just move on, right? After we say, Hey, we can't, you're about five years away from building it and it doesn't meet their timelines for whatever business reasons, then they will, they will move on. So there's some natural just movement in the industry, but we do not have a process right now to cap anything at this point, but. To your point, that's why we're planning for it right now to make sure we're paying attention to it for in preparation for the day that we need to make some adjustments to our plan. Sir. Are you looking at a, a potentially a dedicated rate for data centers or something that will um, potentially, you know, inspire them to conserve looking over the past couple summers and I guess winters, it's been concerning how close we are to rolling brownouts across the state. And I know that we, we, we really can't control what the rest of the state does, but um, just that's uh, it gives me pause when I see that potential growth, um, and uh, you know I just want to know what is being thought about to try to um, I don't know if it's demand response or in some other way limit um, just such a, a enormous growth to the to the peak demand over over you know summer and winter. So. I, I'd like to mention we're starting to continue the conversations with our current and active data center customers to gauge the interest on demand response. And so they had, there has been a willingness to participate at some level. Um, they, they, so I'll just leave it at that, but it's early in the early stages where we're going to continue that as part of our discussion with our partners here. Yes, ma'am. Shanna. Um, I think you guys have all, you're all touching on an issue that's important because it's Certain parts are within CPS Energy's purview, but certain parts are discussions that I think are um, appropriate with our city leaders. Um, and I think the important distinction that I want you all to walk away um, understanding is that as a municipally owned utility, we have the obligation to serve. So a customer comes into our service territory and says, I would like this much power. We um, tell them when we can provide the power. As Ben mentioned, sometimes that's not acceptable for commercial and frankly, we have the same discussions with residential developers. How fast can we get to a bunch of these new residential? Um, and we are required to not discriminate, which um, I'm being very, very um, general and oversimplifying the process, but we take you as you come in line. Um, so some of the questions that I hear people discussing as what does, um, growth management look like or what is smart growth management for the community um, when there are limited resources i think are excellent issues and we're having the internal strategic discussions but i do think that if you have feedback for the city in terms of what kind of development we are encouraging what kind of development we are incenting that those those are conversations that we need to definitely be a part of but don't necessarily drive as the owner Thank you, Shanna. Another question? Yeah, and forgive me, I, I came in late, so you may have touched on this, but is, is, 
Are CPS Energy and the city having any conversations with these major uh, 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 energy users of like a community reinvestment agreement? So that way, you know, there's some type of give back to the community since there is such a constraint and a stressor on the community and then, the, you know, taxpayers having to pay more for energy usage, etc. Like, is there any type of agreement? For them, there is not, and I think that's to Shanna's point. That's really one of the things that goes back to, to the city conversations. Right. And so, just to note that, you know, because obviously you all are the ones that are having the more uh, executive level conversations with the city, just some type of right. agreement to reinvest back into the community, since these these are major corporations. And I think that there should be some incentive to bring more economic growth through these organizations, but also there should be some kind of reinvestment back into the community through these, like we've seen in other major cities. Seattle's a great uh, example of that. Austin is a great example of that with Dell. And so I'd like to see some more of those innovations to be reinvested back into the community if we do that. Absolutely. And I, I accept your invitation and also extend one to everyone here. Please give your feedback as constituents to your city council members about, you know, we talk about what we are able to do, but you are the residents that speak for what you want your community to look like and the benefits you want. Oh, I'll be speaking. <laughs> <laughs> I know I shouldn't have encouraged that. Maybe that was dangerous. <laughs> Oh, sorry, but it's also a, a, a pricing lever that we have, right? There's the explicit give back, which Lawson correctly described, but there's also pricing, right? There's a mechanism there about kind of providing some sort of a balance between residential, small, small commercial and these big users. Absolutely. Um, again, the constraints we're working within is um, a, the basic rules, which are we have to recover the costs from customers to provide service. That's the minimum we have to recover. The other major rule is that we cannot discriminate against customers. Um, but I do think the continued feedback from this group and from the public about whether you want rates that are structured to be as affordable as possible is one goal you might have. To um, incent environmentally friendly behavior is another goal. Conservation might be another goal. Um, I will guarantee you that investor owned utilities are not talking about ways to structure their rates to conserve. So there are unique dynamics that are built into each rate structure to incent different behavior. But again, that is the feedback we're looking for from the public to understand what you want your rates to do. I would say historically our community has said very clearly in their customer preferences that they want rates that allow reliable and affordable service. That is very different rate structure than one that would incent conservation. Um, and so I think we need to, it will be a full and robust dialogue about the what are the drivers that this community right now wants. But is that at the at at CPS and these large data centers, or is that discussion at the city council? No, I think that in terms of what you want the rates to look at, that yeah. is feedback that you should absolutely give us um, because we want to understand what's the right structure to design to give you. I guess I'm asking what's the forum? I think I think both. I guess I okay. think I think okay. both. Um, I do think that if we want to conserve energy, um, usage throughout our community, whether or not we want to continue to recruit and draw in large load customers is a question. Can you do both of those things at the same time? Ben raised the their ability to impact and play a role in demand response is is much greater on a single customer than you could get um, from a residential customer. Over this past winter, I know that um, through the voluntary agreements of large load customers, we were able to set up a system where, and again, I'm being very, very general, but had there been a um, mandatory load shed, we get assigned a percentage of overall load that we have to shed. Those commercial customers that are large load stood up and said, we will shut down our facilities, thus avoiding an impact to residents. So that's sort of a, that is, that is one of the benefits, Lawson, I think that these sort of customers could provide. And I think it's discussions that, I think it's feedback you give to us. And I think it's feedback that we, that you continue discussing with your city leaders. Yeah, I'll, I'll put on my Frost Bank representative hat. Uh, Frost Bank is one of the providers that we have two data centers in the CPS service area. And we have um, the ability to take those offline, which we've done at least twice, maybe three times in high peak. The problem with that is it's, um, we have diesel generators, so it's much less efficient and much more um, problematic in terms of emissions 
than just mm -hmm. getting uh, off the grid. So we've been talking about these large users coming in and that is an issue, but also keep in mind that some of these users are companies that are already here in San Antonio in the in their service area, like Frostbank, USAA, HEB, uh, large users. So it's not just that we're attracting the, yes, and so forth. Any questions? And I, Aaron, I think we kind of answered the second part of your question just by conversation. Okay. Yes, sir. It's, I think we've totally derailed your presentation, but no, that's, I have this is about. actually two kind of unrelated questions. So from one perspective, since we're a municipal utility, as is Austin and Garland and El Paso and some other places, um, our interaction with these large companies that want to come in with the data centers is going to be different, I think, than the commercial situations that you see in Dallas and Houston which it's a free for all with the private providers. They're a totally different mindset, you know, from those companies versus the municipal utilities. How is that going to play out here in this as this thing evolves? How is the municipal municipal versus commercial sort of environment? How's that going to play out? How does ERCOT seems like they're going to have to play a role managing that some way? So ERCOT has a a task force that's a large task force that is in place right now that is paying attention to these kinds of customers across Texas. So whether you're a municipality or, or an IOU, it, it, it's load, it's load, right? It's load on the grid that, that needs to be paid attention to. And ERCOT has a, a task force that has all the utilities involved that we're talking about, about that and have a seat at the table about what we're going to do to help pay attention to these customers. And then if there's regulations or different approaches that need to be done to, to manage these types of customers. Okay, so they are keeping in mind the difference between the commercial versus the municipal utilities. It's no, funny. not in the discussions I've been in, it's been more <laughs> just about the load and the, the load implications on the system. Okay. It's not really focused on whether or not you're a municipality or an IOU, for example. Okay. Well. I've I'm in the geeky engineer meetings. I'm not in the, the other uh, ones. So hey, I, can maybe relate, I relate to the geeky engineer. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I relate to that. Good. Um, okay, so totally different question. So we've talked here about data centers, but what about the crypto mining garbage that goes on that's even more power consuming than these things are, I think. So I had I'm the luxury, right. I guess, of a couple of years ago, there was an interest. I think it was really... It was about two years ago where there was an interest, but they flew in and flew out pretty quickly. But at this point, we don't have any uh, crypto miners on the on the books or of interest right now that we're working with. Mm -hmm. They're more traditional at data centers. Okay. Um, just just to talk, I know I mentioned earlier we were going to touch on you know, where where they're looking to put data centers. So we have a. Uh, Kind of a heat map of where we have a significant amount of interest uh, for data centers, and it's it is putting some strain on the on the transmission system. So we we've put it out there. Like I said, we had a, the risk management committee to kind of say, hey, customers, right, let's start looking in other places. Not necessarily that there's available power there, but we know that it's going to be a longer runway for us to serve you in this area if you continue to look in the area uh, of this town here. So let's start looking other places. Was really the message to these kinds of customers because it drives significant amount of of transmission. And there's a lot of interest. We're getting a lot of interest from the business, the business community uh, that are in the development space that are, you know, pitching uh, these properties to, to data centers as well. So we're making sure that we're communicating with them to understand some of the the constraints we have in this particular part of our town right now, just so that they know that when we tell them it's a longer run way to serve, that they're not surprised. So in these, these areas, the heat map is showing, so those are the kind of the stressor points, correct? Correct. Um, is, and I'm sorry, my, my vision is not as great as most people would assume it would be, but is this also near where the new hospital is being built? And what are you all doing to ensure that like that hospital one, I'm just assuming it'll be on a prioritized uh, energy line, but 
um, how is that going to impact the constraints that are also within this area of stress and upper energy utilization? Good question. So our planning process, if, a hospital, if you already see a hospital being built, we knew about it a few years ago, so that's already in the plan. Some of these requests are a little, a little more, a little newer, and so I'm going to say that our planning process catches that. Good question. Um, and I know it says southeast and east, but like I said, there's not really a guarantee that there's power there because it depends on how much power you're asking for. Right, so there could still be a limitation anywhere in our service territory, depending on the ask. And like I said, we, we're getting questions, you know, 360 to 500 to 800 megawatts, which is, I feel like they're just trying to lock in some power, but we're, we're trying to have real conversations about what we can serve in the, in the short term. Uh, so the large power request is front and center in this conversation, but actually it, at CPS, like I mentioned, it's part of our integrated strategic discussions that we're having from, from our CEO and President CEO Rudigars on down. And it, it, it is significant, right? It is a different level of service that we're having to provide to this kind of customer because of the transmission analysis and the generation plan and the transmission system upgrades that we have to do and the substation and transmission teams that have to build this large infrastructure. Uh, we also have wrapped around here robust legal uh, process that Shannon is very familiar with. And so Shannon is a great partner, her and her team, to minimize the risk associated with a, a customer should they decide to walk away. And so we have a, we've put a, some process in place to really understand the terms up front and then get into, uh, we have surety requirements uh, that minimize the risk to CPS energy as we start to build some of this large infrastructure should a customer walk away. Uh, we're not left, uh, our customers aren't left without uh, being reimbursed. So we have a reimbursement process that's put in place. Yes, ma'am. Ben was very gracious. Um, I'm all the obstacles that he has to overcome in keeping customers happy. Um, you know, you asked, uh, uh, there was a question asked earlier about, um, you know, is there a way for these customers to come in and build their own infrastructure? And the benefit to that you would think is, you know, they assume the cost. And um, we have a lot of requests to come in and do things differently. Usually it is faster and gives them, um, frankly, a competitive advantage over um, their uh, other people that want to do the same things. We are hamstrung a little bit by that legal requirement that says we have to treat all customers the same. We also have to preserve our ability um, to protect the fact that we are the sole provider in our service territory. And some of these things might amount to essentially becoming a reseller of electricity, even if they're only reselling it to themselves. So that was very gracious of Ben, but we are trying to say yes to everything that we are legally allowed to say yes to in a way that benefits all of our community. So I want to reassure you of that. But there are, um, frankly, um, some obstacles that are always there with the law. Um, the market moves faster than the law changes, and we are pushing very hard uh, with our policymakers and with our regulators to understand how we need to change some of those rules to um, deal with the reality of what our customers want right now. So we're thinking through it, and Ben's team does a wonderful job um, of delivering some really tough news, but I do feel like that what you might hear is CPS doesn't move fast enough. Um, I'm willing to pay for it for the economic benefit of customers, and they're saying no, and it's not because we don't want to attract customers. We don't want them to, to um, move as quickly as we possibly can. It's just simply that some of the limitations don't allow us to do some of the very innovative things that these folks do in other markets where there are investor-owned utilities that have a little more flexibility in that than we do. Thank you, Shanna, for the assist. Appreciate it. Well, you know, it's all good. <laughs> um, I think this is my last slide, but uh, just to kind of circle back, just to, you, there's only a few of the departments up here, but it's really, you know, the, the, the care that we all have to have across the organization for this kind of customer is real, and it's a little different. And so it's new, so we've organized around it to, to make sure we're doing the best we can for this kind of customer. Um, and, and then, like I mentioned, they are putting some strain on the generation plan, and we're paying attention to that. And I'll open it up for questions, but I know you guys have been pretty active along the way, so. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am.
Thank you so much, Ben. I'll just take it off. Okay. So we're going to have the committee round table now. Do you want to go around it? <laughs> Do you want to go? Okay, round table begins. Do we have anything from District 1? Any questions? District 2? I did have a question. It did not come for me from somebody in District 2, but I think it's still um, a, a good question to bring up. Um, I had a few folks, uh, and it's come up a few times, uh, our solar panel uh, customers. Um, there were some questions, comments, feedback on whether or not like there's any type of buyback program or in, like what the real incentive is for them to be solar versus just being a normal energy user and wanting to know um, if there was anything in the pipeline for CPS Energy to bring more incentives to them being solar um, users. And so I just wanted to bring that feedback to the committee and to CPS Energy since that was something that was that was um, brought to me because I do think that I would, I would hate for us to discourage our solar users or our alternative energy users from wanting to do something that would help to, you know, loose, lessen the load, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that um, Elena Ball, our chief strategy officer, is working on right now is what some of the um, changes that we might want to make for that strategic purpose um, to both incent um, conservation, but in a way that works for the entire community um, and um, that provides you know, environmental benefits to all of us. And so she is looking at a number of our tariffs to see what we can do. Um, I think that the issue you raised uh, has a lot to do with what uh, residential customers are incented to do, but it overlaps very heavily with what Ben was just talking about. Some of our large commercial customers also want to be um, to have a rate structure that allows them to do what their ESG programs are, are requiring them to do and in a way that is mutually beneficial to us in the system. So we're absolutely thinking through that. Um, we actually um, have been talking about what some of the necessary tariff changes might be. And I say tariff, that will often result in actual rate changes, but sometimes it's just the structure and nature, not the price. Um, but it's very beneficial to, <laughs> to everyone. Um, and I think that we are looking at those right now, and those would require both board approval and council approval to change those tariff rates. And I expect those to be um, next up in front of the public for input. So we should have something for you all to look at and consider shortly. Good. Uh, District 3, I would, well, I think at the summer meeting, we wound up uh, mentioning to Rudy if there was going to be any type of clearinghouse, more or less, on recommendations of who are reputable solar uh, vendors out there that we could relay to our the citizens in our districts. And I was wondering if there's any progress on that. I will follow up and I can tell you if it's on Rudy's list, it's now number one on my list. Um, and again, the legal obstacle, I always feel like I'm like, hey, good news. Bad. Yeah, well, like I said, I, I took a real estate class in October. I'm getting ready to pass my, my state and national exam. But when they, I was really surprised that they brought up solar is not a really good in, you know, incentive for buyers out there right now. And we kind of try to discourage people to get homes with solar because it, it really is a mess depending on who the initial installer for the house they're looking at is. So I want to be sure that, because I'm looking at solar myself. So I know that was one topic we talked about in December, but I didn't know how far it, the conversation got. It's, it's me. I'm the holdup. Um, again, one of the limitations on a municipally owned utility is we can't make references or imply a mm -hmm. partnership or endorsement where one does not exist. So we are looking for um, what would be an equivalent third party um, you know, list of vendors that that we could provide to, to folks without violating that non endorsement rule. I do think, having said that, <laughs> as speaking as a homeowner now, not the general counsel, you should be very careful because when you get the installation, it's that homeowner's terrifying triangle when it breaks of was it the installer, was it the service provider, or was it the homeowner? Um, we, I think most of us see it. Same thing happens when you have smart thermostats or, um, you know, Nest systems, um, it, it happens. So I will um, follow up with you directly for us to distribute to the committee in very short order. Wonderful, because I think that would be a good thing to have at our open houses that we're starting to have again. So uh, anybody, anything from District 4? District 4? Um, oh, yeah. 
Uh, for District 4, um, we have citizens that are interested in, you know, applying for the Casa Verde program, weatherization program in our area. Um, I know, I think we just got funding for that again, and I guess we more education for the 2024 process and the criteria what needs to be, you know, to be added to the list or to be a, a uh, candidate for that program. Um, we have a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, elderly citizens uh, of the age 65 that are on a fixed income and are looking for ways to reduce their energy uh, costs. And we also have uh, low income families in the same boat as well, especially if they're in uh, affordable housing situations where sometimes it's fixed and sometimes it's not. So they're looking for either help with um, apartment rent, rent assistance or energy assistance. It's one or the other. I, we, I guess more information to be passed back to my uh, district. Thank you. On. I don't need it. Uh, I wanted just to update you that crew right now is setting uh, different things that are going on in everyone's district and they're to address those very things. They're, they're coming out to do education, especially for the underserved community. And as those are scheduled, I'm sending them on. Uh, what I can do is let you know where everyone's are, if you like, just so that for now you can send people in your district to go get education somewhere else until it comes directly to your district. But as they're going from district to district, it's not one event that they're setting, it's like five or six. And they're setting them out all the way to April right now. And then in April, they'll set them out again all the way into the summer. So they're they're making quite the effort to get out and educate people and get as many people involved in these programs as they can. Is there a way that maybe one of the events we can get it um, not televised, like uh, a, a, a recording that we can pass along? Because they're they're going to be repeat questions, and they're going to want to want it from the, it's the same answer no matter which one they go to. Only for I have we do have some citizens that um, they do have uh, they're impacted with child services yes. and work schedules. And I understand. They can't really move. Yeah. And so that um there's, there's another aspect of those that are, we're trying to take care of as well without sending everybody everywhere. I am willing to bet that crew already has a trifold that addresses those. I'll get a hold of those and make sure that they get to you and anyone else who would like to have that information. Anything in district seven, eight. There we go. Um, I don't know, Diana, maybe this is a question that, uh, we need we might need to go to executive session or something I'm not sure about but since Shanna's yeah. since Shanna's here she can answer that um, I just wondered we still kind of waiting to see about the changes to the structure session when we're done with the round table. okay okay I didn't realize that okay that's it district nine how about ten yes ma'am Okay, thank you. So I I don't know if this applies in this round, but I encountered a resident who's on a fixed income, a widow, and her backyard has an alleyway, and there's power lines that run through there, and there's overgrowth and tree branches that are kind of tangled up in with the lines. So she called the city to have them removed, and the city said that it was the resident's uh, I guess, responsibility, even though it's in the alley. And then I guess she wanted me to find out if there was any CPS programs that would help with that, because her concern is that those um, branches may overgrow and eventually damage some of the lines, which is right in her backyard and may affect her services. So right now, the um, the way the uh, responsibility is divided up is we take care of um, transmission lines and then um, distribution lines um, on homeowners property. Uh, homeowners are responsible for the vegetation management there. Uh, what I would like to do is get with you after the meeting so I can find out this particular person's address if they're okay with us doing that. Um, I find that a resident describing a line is not the most helpful way to decide which type of line it is. But we routinely, for this is for anyone, if a customer has a question about whether those lines can be trimmed back by us 
or if we can um, coordinate with a city service to do that, um, find a way and get them with um, a third party agency that might help them with homeowner maintenance costs that are safety related. Uh, we have teams that do all of those things and we can generally figure out a resolution that works best for everyone. So if I could follow up directly and figure out where the home is and which line it is, that's the fastest way to resolve that. Thank you. How about any of our at large members? Anyone have anything for the round table? Aaron. Just a quick question. <clears throat> really interested in knowing um, if there's anything in the works for electric vehicle charging in particular, using the cars to um, get back to the grid during times of high demand. I, I think I've asked about this before, but whether there's any <clears throat> pilots in place or anything trying to get ahead of that, what's probably going to be uh, a big trend in the next couple of years. The uh, EV charger uh, issue is on the the list of very. It's a, it's a very short list. I think there's four tariffs that we're looking at, but the EV charger um, issue is on that list of things. And again, uh, part of it is um, considering how do we incent the building of infrastructure that will support the growth of um, EV chargers and electrification? How do we balance out that additional um, load demand with you know, limitations of uh, load that we have right now? And then how do we do that in a way that is bi-directionally beneficial to both the EV owners and the community? So absolutely on our list and in that group of tariffs that I expect to, to go before the public very quickly. Bob, go ahead. And just to remind you guys, we do want to break for executive session. So let, we're going to get through our questions. as fast. True. That just prompted me uh, listening to Aaron and some of the discussion earlier with Ben. Um, I should have asked earlier, but we, in our plants, we used to have this guaranteed power um, performance, if you want to call it that. We always, get, we were never cut low. Cut, our load was never cut. I'm starting to think it, what is the load sharing process and who makes that determination? Because that's where I, it's a supply and demand issue. And with the higher demand, I don't know if the supply is going to be there in time. So I'm just curious. You don't have to, we don't have to get in a big discussion, but I'm just wondering if there's a simple answer to that. Um, our tariff specifically says you do not have guaranteed load. So, and that's for every customer of every type. In the state of Texas, uh, we don't guarantee uninterrupted delivery of power. However, uh, we would not be an attractive market if it wasn't pretty darn reliable, and we have been pretty good historically. And so that's that's the short answer. But um, you know, touching back on some of the um, rate structure and design issues, I think are where we get into the meat of the discussion that you have there. Um, if there is a um, uh, load shed order issued from ERCOT, which means, you know, the the gap between the supply and the demand is too, too narrow, um, and we have a megawatt uh, amount that we are required to shed for our service area. The load shed there is done um, by the nerdy engineers that figure out how to do that in, I say nerdy, but to me, that's a compliment. Um, definitely a member of the nerd club, um, but we do so in a way that maintains stability across the area. So it may not be um, based on type of customer. Um, it's not always based on amount of load, but they do it in a way that is um, sound from an engineering perspective, perspective, maintain stability of the grid with the idea that you do it in a way that impacts the least amount of people possible and in a way that can be restored as quickly as possible. So it is not based on type of customer load at all. No, Shadda, you should have just said we're using AI like everybody else. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. Hey, if that's all for the round table, I just then I wanted to say thanks to Ben for the presentation and, okay. and comment that this is the kind of discussion that this committee was set up for. If and when this committee uh, gets more involved in setting rates and, and things and designing rates, that's the kind of discussion we need to have. So I did appreciate that. Anyone else? Okay, now that we'll, we'll go ahead and end this meeting and prepare for our executive session.